We're here at uh, 1045 and our participants are, are growing here on a, already an eventful day. Uh, we do plan on going longer uh, today than our uh, scheduled half an hour based on information that was received. And, and please understand in our consistent communication with uh, MDE and MDH, um, you know, we received this information before nine o'clock this morning and again are preparing uh, for you today uh, information that will assist you as soon as possible. Uh, know that that, uh, that information immediately goes into effect. At the same time, uh, you as a, as a school district do not have to implement immediately. We'll talk more about that, but you do have local control to make decisions on your own with the most re recent information that you've seen or maybe haven't seen yet. Uh, we're gonna work with you uh, to assist you, to allow you to, uh, to be successful in implementing when you so choose to do so, but do so right and do so uh, as an admin team or as a local school district uh, in implementing new guidelines. Uh, we recommend that you are, have support in doing so. So for our agenda for today, uh, Laura is running our slides. If we could go to that agenda uh, very quickly uh, this morning. And again, we're working up to the last minute in today's lead meeting to uh, get the best information for you. We're gonna give you updates on that event facility management. Also length of, uh, of the seasons and contests and, and when, uh, what the details behind that are yet here today. Um, coaching out of season, just an update on bylaw 208 as, uh, as things emerge around uh, who can do what with uh, time in, be in between seasons, which was released last week. Uh, with volleyball games going on tonight, football, a couple items that we've noticed and updates the guidelines, and then uh, our, our COVID interrupted, interrupted competition guidelines as people need those too. As, as we're starting to see numbers go, again, in the wrong directions and, and, and more interruptions taking place. Uh, just understand what that means in terms of games and competitions, forfeitures versus no games, those, uh, those uh, items and where to find that. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Eric to uh, begin us with the event and facility guidance. Uh, Eric? Thanks so much, Bob, and uh, good morning, everyone. And and you know that you've been leading in real time uh, since this began back in March, and uh, and we're still in that same mode. Uh, as as things adjust or change around us, uh, we we have to be ready to uh, do our best to provide information directly back to you. Um, uh, to go back and think about timelines, uh, since the beginning of our uh, our fall sports season back in August, we've been talking with the Department of Health and Department of Education around uh, the, the differential that exists within uh, the rules for youth sports versus what's happening within our high school uh, approved activities and, and where those differences are and the challenge that that creates for our schools. Um, and so I've been in consistent conversation with them talking about where those things are. Uh, they have talked about uh, finding ways to bring those more in alignment with one another. Um, and, uh, and as late as uh, midday yesterday, didn't have any clear information on when things might change if they were going to change. Uh, we've, we've been uh, talking with them for quite some time. Late in the day, uh, got some indication that, uh, that this could be coming sooner than later. And at 10.30 last night was the first time that I saw a draft of any of the language that was posted here this morning at 9 a.m. We just say a couple of things that uh, that one thing that uh, we know, first of all, is this does not make anyone's job easier uh, on this call. It doesn't make the work of our schools any easier. Uh, there is there's some some good successful implementation when people have time to get information, be able to plan for it and to put it into place. And Bob made mention of uh, the fact of taking uh, the time you need as a school to put the best plans in place being critical. Um, and so uh, what we need to do is we need to get our guidance and information updated as quickly as we can based on what those new rules are. Our rules for state high school league events uh, in terms of spectators and those things have been built off the recommendations and the guidance that's been provided by Department of Health and Department of Ed all the way along. When that information changes or when it becomes more specific, that means that then our guidance needs to change and be in alignment with that. We have lots of control over the playing of the games, the, the handling of the contests, the length of the seasons, all of those things that happen. Uh, spectators and managing your events and your facilities is something where we're working really hard to assist you by going through the information and then giving the most clear information that we can as we go forward. 
Um, and so uh, as we saw new information on the final draft of language came to us just before 9 a.m. this morning. Uh, and shortly after that, uh, we put out information that said this had been recently updated. And uh, shortly after 10, we shared the information in regards to a draft of where our guidance would look as we go forward. The school impact that you're gonna see is that you're gonna to continue to get inundated with folks that are going to be asking for things. And uh, just as it's happening here at our office and, and in organizations that need to uh, set guidance and uh, make decisions about how implementation happens, that's going to continue to happen. We continue to be focused on trying to directly communicate with you, provide you with the best information, the timely information about where that goes. Schools always have the opportunity to be more restrictive than what is out there in terms of what's allowed. And a number of schools have done that in a variety of places and have found that to be successful based on where their school district or their specific school is and where their programs are. Um, as, we, as we take a look at that uh, and try and assist you in, in how you go forward, we'd ask that you continue to work with your entire administrative team, whatever that looks like, to build the best plans going forward that we can. Uh, I recognize and, and I'm already hearing from people of how do we not know about this sooner and what does this look like? Part of my ask was if, if there's gonna be change in guidance, that there be a timeline that be uh, addressed to that so that people have time to react and respond. Bob mentioned that you had uh, likely have games uh, scheduled and contests scheduled for tonight. Doesn't mean that this new information means that you change immediately. And there's gonna be a couple of things to think about within the guidance uh, that might lead to, uh, to you making decisions when it comes to that. Um, and so uh, the support that we're gonna provide from the State High School League continues to be around best practices. We need to make sure that we uh, stay in our lane when it comes to uh, what we can do and can't do with things. I had a number of folks that have reached out to me and said, please stay with no fans at indoor events. Uh, and that's come from schools. And I've had many, many more that have said, please allow fans and lots of them come from parents and those, those folks are also talking with you. Uh, but we're here to provide ongoing interpretation and guidance as we go forward uh, day by day as to how to implement these things. And then we're going to continue to communicate and work directly with Department of Health and Department of Ed to try to create the safest possible experience for our students to participate in the activities that they want. You know, there's a number of factors right now that are, that are creating challenge with this. The foremost being that the numbers related to COVID across the state and in communities continue to rise and continue to be a challenge and, and really make this difficult. And, and just as this is happening and change in guidance is being provided, uh, schools are having to adjust their, their uh, educational model. And they're going from distance learning to hybrid learning and hybrid or from hybrid to distance or from in-person to hybrid, whatever it might be as they go forward. Uh, but Bob, before we take a look at what that guidance is and that draft uh, form that we have, are there other thoughts that you have relative to uh, just the process and where we are today? Yeah, no, I, Erica, you know, I, I think uh, things that stand out, the, the governance and governance where we can, right, and clarifying that and making sure that uh, we're allowing schools to be successful and also recognizing the pressure uh, that that's creating. I believe there's a number of chats that are coming in around that and, and many of them around the timing, right? And uh, why are we finding out now or in this short period of time? And I think you've, you've noted that, Eric, that this is not ideal for us, nor is it ideal for you that, that we have to implement. But when you implement, again, take the time to do so right. That being said, Eric, I think we should go yes, to sir. Um, the guidance itself and uh, can we walk through that. And maybe, Laura, you can assist us uh, as to what we have and where we're at in the draft. And let, let's remember that this is a draft form right, a draft format um, around what we're sharing. So Laura, anything you would like to uh, note at this time? Absolutely, let me pe walk people through just a few things. Um, this is the page where the actual um, document from MDE is found. It is down in this 2020-21 planning guide from Minnesota Public Schools updated today. The actual guidance begins on about page 20 of that. And that's where you can find about three to four pages of um, single spaced information that MDE provided today. Um, our updated guidance and information, this page that has updated guidance and information COVID related is a link directly off the right side of your dashboard. And this is an ongoing growing list of the various documents that we've put out. One of the documents on there is the draft, marked draft up at the top, event and facility management. 
So this is what we have been using this morning as we've taken the, the direct information from MDE and started to group and move it into more usable formats for our member schools. So Eric, I think I'll turn it back to you at this point. Sounds good, Laura. And if you wanna uh, just uh, increase that size a little bit, a couple of things to, to keep in mind as we go forward is uh, that our facility management is based on the, the information that's provided by the Department of Ed and uh, the Department of Health. And, uh, and the documents that are used to create this uh, information is there. Things that continue to come forward as they adjust their information. And keep in mind that uh, just like your superintendents or presidents may get information directly from the Department of Ed or Department of Health slightly before it comes out to the public, that all comes as embargoed information. Uh, that's not different. And so when I say I saw first draft, that was only with complete embargo requirements that that not go out to anyone else. And, uh, and that's the difficulty. And uh, recognize that that frustration is there that uh, everyone's seeing at the same time, but again, they're posting it publicly uh, and that's what we can operate based on. As you look at the definitions, um, they're using terms of participants, spectators, event, school facility, non-school facility. And so those participants are going to be those, uh, those individuals who are specific to the actual event that's taking place. And remember that the guidance has now broadened to be activities, athletics, youth sports, clubs, and all school events. So athletes, performers, competitors, student workers, coaches, advisors is far more inclusive um, but when you think about participants, think about those that are uh, part of the actual event that's going on. So in a band concert, we're talking about those that are participating in the band and are playing. We're talking about a volleyball game, though we're talking about those uh, students that are participating in volleyball or the student manager or someone like that that's specific to that. Spectators are anyone else that is present um, but isn't included in that participant pod. And so then the events, as we talk about, uh, they've got a listing that's there. And then school facility versus non-school facility. This is an important uh, differentiation. And the school facility is the place where education takes place at some point. May not be at the time that your event's going on, but if there is any instruction going on or school uh, taking place, that becomes a school facility. A non-school facility is typically owned by somebody else and is leased by a school for the purpose of events. A couple key pieces in the spectator expectations. As we think about working toward indoor uh, spectators, one of the things that's key there is that spectators should be separated from the competition pod by at least 12 feet uh, at all times. And that is a, a challenging piece to think about, um, but that allows for the numbers to be calculated in the way that they are. If spectators are not able to be kept at a distance of 12 feet or more, then that means that all people in the particular venue must count in the same pod and that will go towards your capacity, which we'll spend a little bit of time on shortly. Spectators should be separated by at least six feet, social distancing at all times, and they can be uh, seated or grouped by uh, household groups, just as you would expect uh, when they attend other things. For indoor events, and I mentioned this, if we can't keep those 12 feet distance, then that's where uh, everyone starts to count. Um, we're going to work on the formatting so we don't get things that are broken apart here, um, but masks indoors for all spectators are required. That's part of what we need to do and that's part of the uh, executive order of the governor. When we talk about outdoor events, spectators sh should be wearing masks at all times when they're entering and exiting the, feeling at the facility and they should also be wearing them whenever possible while there. Um, if social distancing is not possible, then they're required to be worn. But wearing masks helps keep everyone safer at these events and that's really the guidance uh, and the goal that we have when we provide these things. As we move down to spectator capacity, a couple of things that are key as we think about this. Um, first of all is that you should not be selling tickets at the event. Things should be done beforehand. Recognize that that makes a challenge if that's today or tomorrow to have those kinds of things in place. Um, but we should not have walk up uh, sales for tickets and that goes to the second bullet point right there that is in their guidance from MDE that anyone attending an indoor event must be registered in advance with a name an email or a phone number for the purpose of contact tracing and being able to identify participants and who might have been there should there be something that happens. The indoor attendance capacity is listed here and it's always the lesser of the options that are included. You can never exceed any of these so it starts with two spectators per participant. 
A second uh, bullet on that would be 25% of the venue capacity. So identifying your venue capacities will be key. And then the maximum that can be there is 250. And remember that 250 can be specific to spectators when you create at least a 12 foot barrier between the spectator pod and the, uh, the competition pod. If we're at a non-school facility, then the two spectator per participant limit is not included necessarily. Uh, some may choose to use that as their plan for how they go forward and, and that might be their season long approach to what they do. But this goes back to the general uh, rule of 25% of the venue capacity, not ever to exceed 250 attendees. And again, those practices of keeping the competition pod separate from the spectator pod is critical. We talk about outdoor capacity, we're at 25% of venue capacity or 250 attendees. And we've talked a number of times here that those attendees, again, keeping that social distance from the competition pod is key. And those 250 attendees uh, are specific to the spectators there. So been talking through this quickly. I know that Laura and Bob and Jody and others have been a part of this. Anything in those early points that uh, you think bear either repeating or further clarification? I think, uh, Eric, just to clarify again, really the, the changes that are taking place, um, you know, the focus areas are on the indoor. And what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing is the two spectators per participant, right? And uh, the participant is defined as those that are competing in that venue uh, at that time. Is that correct, Eric? That is correct. All right, uh, uh, Laura or Jody or anybody else, anything we're seeing in chat, I know we're, we're watching our text too, anything else we should highlight on this, on this document? Laura, maybe mention where we will, um, where ADs will be able to find this yep. and how they will get this. So again, just a reminder, the sports guidance and information is a, is a long list. This document currently is at the bottom labeled draft. Our goal is to continue to work to update this. Um, we will update with a timestamp likely when it gets updated later today to get you the most current information. Great, uh, thank you very much, uh, Laura. And, and we'll continue to monitor this. And, uh, and uh, we know that it's difficult. We live in a time of social media. So as things are released before we can even get to them and, and uh, you having to keep track of, of where things are at. We do the best that we can and working in public meetings, public settings, with also understanding that uh, you may not be the first to find out, but we did get this out as quickly as we possibly could, could today, uh, the best possible draft form that we could today as well. Another hot topic here right now is around uh, our length of seasons as we enter postseason with our approved sports. So if we could go to the next slide, please, Laura, around uh, the length of seasons. And Eric, I'm gonna have you start us here as well. Thanks, Bob. And, uh, and this is clarification is where this really uh, exists. And this is not different than how it's been applied in the past, yet it feels different because we've had COVID interruptions and other kinds of things, and also have had shortened seasons, both in length and in number of competitions. And so what I would say is that appetite to uh, maximize the number of competitions becomes critical uh, for our schools. They wanna take advantage if they can, especially if they've had student uh, programs that have been interrupted due to COVID or uh, individuals that haven't been able to participate. Uh, the bylaws within the State High School League allow for teams to continue through the entirety of the season if they so choose. And so from a practice perspective, if a section tournament is completed prior to the last day of the official State High School League season, a program can continue to practice until the last day of that season. So just make note of that if, if uh, uh, you know, for, for instance, your swim or your cross country or your tennis uh, want to continue beyond either their elimination uh, or when the section tournament ends, our end of season dates have not changed since they were uh, published for those particular sports and they can continue to meet and practice as a team if they choose to. Teams are also able to have contests during the postseason time period, and they need to do that by following the bylaws and also the regular season sports specific guidelines that are in place by the State High School League for this current year for that activity. Again, that would be abiding by the number of teams that can participate, the ways in which those contests can take place. And again, they can never exceed the number of contests 
that are part of the regular season because you're replacing a regular season or putting a regular season contest in the postseason. It doesn't become separate from those. So if your team has maximized their number of regular season sport specific uh, options, then they are going to be done. So again, you could play additional games or participate in additional contests after you're eliminated if you choose to do so. Uh, but you have to make sure that everyone that's involved in that uh, would not be exceeding the regular season limit on contests and that everything that you do would be abiding by the regular season competition plans. So Bob, hopefully that makes sense, but uh, let, let, me, uh, let me know if there's more that should be included. No, I, Eric, I think it does make sense. I think one of the popular questions is that, uh, is that team or coach and or students um, covered under catastrophic insurance? And yes, because that it continues to be a part of our season. Uh, they would be as well. And I think uh, we have to remember and, and differentiate that if you continue to practice and or play um, during postseason, that you're following the regular season sports specific guidelines, right? That is where we get many of those questions and um, following those approved sports specific guidelines uh, during these COVID times is going to be very important. So uh, we'll continue to look for themes in there. If there's anything else, we can get to it later. Otherwise, Laura, Let's move on to coaching out of season. And um, this is language really right out of bylaw 208. And there's a QA and a at the end of 208 uh, regarding what coaches may and may not do um, around coaching out of season. And these questions that come up, um, refer back to that. Uh, this is information that we'll, we'll get back out to you again uh, as soon as we can here that will assist you in working with your coaches. You know, I there's things that uh, directly stick out to me as a, as a former AD and now working in, in uh, this area as well, but what you may and may not provide, right? Uh, administering programs directly um, or unduly, uh, in, unduly influencing student athletes to participate or organizing uh, things like that are a non-school roster uh, that, that can compromise, compromise his or her um, participation. Again, be very careful what your coaches are doing outside of our season and utilize the language that is here and utilize the language directly in bylaw 208 uh, that would allow them to uh, continue to coach and not compromise their ability to do so as well. So uh, anything I missed there, Eric or our staff um, around yep. the season? Jody, I think directly to volleyball this year with exceptions. Um, yeah, Bob, let me jump in here a second on uh, the board uh, decision to allow uh, student athletes to try out for a non-school team. The two dates that they may do so, and again, this, this is relevant to any student who is on a C squad, B squad, sophomore, JV, or varsity volleyball team. They may try out uh, for a non-school team on November 1st and or November 8th only. There have been some questions around seventh and eighth graders who are playing up on a C squad or a JV or varsity team. And could they also try out, there's another date of October 24th. The board did not approve October 24th as an option. So again, the only date student athletes may try out for a non-school team during the high school season for this year only is November 1st and 8th. I would also draw your attention to what coaches may not do. Uh, coaches may not be a part of those tryouts with student athletes who are currently on their high school team. They may not direct, place, organize tryouts. They may not be a part of those tryouts. And again, for two reasons. One, because of bylaw 208, and two, because those tryouts are both taking place on Sundays. And high school coaches may not have access to their student athletes on Sundays. So Bob, I would turn it back to you. Um, and if Susie, you're seeing anything in the chat that needs to be addressed around this, we could certainly do that as well. Yeah, and I think two key concepts as we leave 208 here, organize a nine school team and or select players for a team comprised of your team members. Uh, you know, those are areas that stick out in this language uh, as opportunities arise for our student athletes. So uh, let's go on to uh, slide number six. and. Uh, you know, we're excited that we have contests that are occurring uh, for, uh, as soon as tonight around volleyball. So, Jody, let's start with volleyball and, and anything specific that we can assist uh, uh, for contests as soon as this evening. Yep, thanks, Bob. 
So as it relates to volleyball and line judges, and in the document, the event and facility management guide that Laura had uh, just sent out to all of you, under game personnel, line judges would now be considered uh, essential game personnel and may be used at any level of competition that you choose, as long as they have masks and are social distancing from the student participants that are on the, the court and um, as they best can. So. Uh, line judges, again, may be utilized. This item I'd like to talk about is lower level teams so and or the varsity team in the competition space when your uh, lower uh, level teams are playing. So can they stay or be in the gym and in the facility? And the answer to that is yes, if they remain in their competitive pods and if they remained at least 12 feet of distance between them and the spectator areas. So again, a best practice around this would be identifying bleacher areas that are 12, at least 12 feet removed from your spectator pot or population and ensuring that those student participants are not moving into the spectator areas that you've determined. And so I know a lot of you will travel with all of your teams getting to facilities uh, at a given time. And so again, just identifying a space for those teams to be um, distance is what you really need to be um, concerned with there. And just a, another item is to ensure that they're keeping within their competitive pods when they're entering the, the locker room spaces as well and not having all three or four of your teams in the locker rooms at the same time. The last item is uh, scheduling during the last two weeks of the season. And as you know, on October 1st, the board uh, made a decision to allow for three contests in the last uh, per week during the last two weeks of the season. Uh, these really, uh, this, this was put into place to, to address COVID interruptions, uh, scheduling issues that come from that, and or if you look at official um, challenges or shortages that you may have and that you have to postpone a contest based on that, um, that's what that three contests per week during the last two weeks of the season was put in place. Um, that, that's why it was put in place. And we want to recommend as well that those do not take place on consecutive days. So it's best that we're not playing on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday during that last week. We want to try and space that out over the two weeks or uh, over the week. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you, Jody. And, and uh, Jody did a really nice job of uh, visualizing for you. Hope that that uh, spectator community, you know, and in keeping that uh, separate from our competitive uh, community as uh, our epidemiologists also uh, refer to it as. So how do we separate those, minimize contact, and uh, can try and control that environment to the best of our ability? Football popular questions that come up, uh, you know, hydration, we see it in states around us. How we best hydrate, again, is going to be individually. So that may be cups with a uh, filling station. Use the cup one time, um, throw that away. Uh, individual water bottles. Now, if there's somebody else filling those bottles, uh, make sure that they're masked, make sure that they're wearing gloves, um, and we're not compromising either of the individuals, uh, and, and make sure they're hydrated. We're gonna have a nice day tomorrow when many are playing, uh, and it will be warm, and we wanna make sure that uh, that water is available. But it should look different than it has in the past. You know, I think both volleyball and football alike in that way. What you see on a Friday or Saturday this week should look different, including hydration. Uh, chains, uh, great idea that we've had out there. I believe we'll make this a recommendation in the guidelines when we get an opportunity to update those is uh, let's have your chains uh, or your chain gang as we often refer to it on the home side, right? So we're not uh, mixing any more communities than we have to. So a recommendation would be to have one chain gang our recommendation is where you can have three, I know some that um, you have to have four, right? Because it's how we've always done it. But when you're doing so, let's try and have those on the home sideline so we're not compromising either uh, our chain gangs and or mixing communities and increasing exposure. As interruptions occur, we have not been able to find a great way to uh, document and record those. We're asking that you um, record those on the MFCA website or you can do so on MNI AAA under, game want, under Games Wanted. And uh, our district football chairs have done a great job in working with schools that are seeking contests to the best of their ability. And we're gonna see this in all sports, by the way. 
Uh, I will play during the winter as well as volleyball here yet this fall. So uh, again, making sure that you know who is interested in looking at games and continue to think about uh, what is um, what is local, how your school defines local and or conference versus a district versus uh, section play. So the question around chain gangs, uh, again, we're recommending that you use three, um, but we know that in uh, that recommendation that you, that means you do have flexibility to do, to use more so uh, on that home sidelines four oftentimes is used, but our recommendation is three, not the requirement. Um, that being said, so moving on to, uh, and again, back to football very quickly here. So how we introduce student athletes, what that tunnel looks like on the way out, all of that should look different. Make sure we're physically and socially distancing, uh, again, to make sure that uh, we're, we're, we're putting into practice the protocols that are in place. As we move on here to um, our, our COVID guidance, uh, Laura, let's go to slide seven, please. And then we can go directly to the form that is available to you. So as we have interruptions, remember this is another resource um, that takes place or that you have that when uh, an interruption takes place, you can reference this as well. And Laura, is it safe to say that this is also located on their uh, dashboard? Is that correct? Correct, Bob. Okay. So that is there again, and remember that uh, if you have questions, work with your uh, the school in which you're playing. And if let's say there's a, a question that's coming up, if the school is not comfortable playing you due to your uh, where you're at in terms of your metrics and or exposure to COVID as to where your school is at, that is gonna become a popular question and, and let's work through that, making sure we're working through it with our uh, with your opponent or our fellow member school. So don't forget that that is there. And then um, Laura, I believe let's go on to uh, uh, slide eight, please. Where we're at in progression and some of the things we've updated on that as well. Just a quick note that this document also addresses co-ops, which I've seen a few questions around lately, and then postseason competition. It also addresses um, officials and not having enough officials and what the requirements are to get an emergency a waiver for officials. So all of that again is tucked into this interrupted competition guidance around COVID. And it sounds like we're getting a lot of questions around concessions and that probably goes back to that original uh, guidance that we showed you that's in draft format. That is something that's different and Eric help me out or correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, even as soon as last week or yesterday, we were saying no, no, um, no concessions, period. Now it's a recommendation that you do not have um, concessions, uh, yet you now have flexibility on that according to the most recent um, information. Is that correct, Eric? It is correct, although there are a number of considerations. So the, the number of factors that uh, are part of any kind of distribution of food uh, wouldn't be different necessarily than your food service for your schools. Uh, so you've got to make sure that they would uh, abide by all guidance around any level of food service. And then the other aspect, which is the primary concern, is that concessions are a point of gathering. And so how would you do that that would reduce the, the chance that people are going to be uh, combining at the same place at the same time? And so, uh, you know, I, I think that that's something that continues to be out there. Um, yet uh, the, the guidance that came out from MDE talks about uh, if it's going to happen, it needs to follow the specific rules that are there. Uh, many of you have said, can we say no uh, or are asking about that. You and, uh, and your administrative team along with your district uh, and or school can make decisions relative to those things that work best in your uh, situation, your facilities. So absolutely, Bob, that is, uh, that is where things are at this time. Uh, we continue to try to assist each of you in, uh, in being able to host events as safely as possible for all of our participants. I'm going to, uh, Jody, I'm going to turn it over to you and some uh, questions within uh, uh, chat maybe, or you're hearing some things. Uh, further comments from you, Jody, maybe specific to uh, volleyball? Yes, thanks, Bob. Uh, just a couple of uh, items that have come in through the chat. Uh, just a reminder that the playable surface in volleyball goes beyond the the boundaries of the actual court itself. And so as you are identifying your spectator areas, I would remove that spectator space up 12 feet from the playable surface. 
If that's your bench extended, that's fine. We just, again, need to create a separation of at least 12 feet from what is considered playable in your gymnasium. Um, we had a question regarding introductions, and if we're going to allow spectators into the gym, then absolutely introduction should be a part of that uh, procedure or process, I would say, for your starting lineup. And we'll provide some additional information for you as it relates to um, the specifications um, that are in the current guidelines, and those will be updated. The final comment or question was, do we allow bands and or cheer or dance in our indoor, at our indoor events? And the answer to that is no. Uh, cheerleading, dance, and or pep bands may not be a part of that experience at this time. And that comes directly out of that guideline that was provided by MDE. So thank you, Bob, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, and, and again, questions around uh, how introductions look, right? Let, let's make sure that we're practicing protocols that we have that tunnel, it's probably looking different than it did a year ago, uh, where we're spreading the spreading athletes out, although we're in that pod already in a competitive pod. <clears throat> Just consider that as you um, put into place uh, these game protocols. And we and, and remember, we did have some games last week, too. We did have, we did have uh, five or six, I believe, zero week games. And you've done a fantastic job of managing with the protocols that are in place. But it should look different when necessary uh, from last year. Remember in football, we're spreading out that field to the tens, right? You have that flexibility for coaches and student athletes. So use that conceptually uh, throughout the game to make sure we're spreading people out. Um, that being said, uh, Laura, let's go back to the progression and I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, to some of the changes uh, made from last week. So in a, in a day when everything seems extra new, this slide should look somewhat familiar to you. Um, recent updates, open gym, captain's practices, and spring season training seasons being held this fall, those remain all under local control. <coughs> and decision for you within your district to, to, to take part in or not take part in any of those at this point. Um, we are working to get a post-COVID medical clearance form that our board began work on at its last meeting and is moving through sports medicine. Our goal is to get that out to you within the next week. So any participants you may have coming back after being out with a diagnosed COVID diagnosis, that will be for them. And then as we move into post-season guidance for volleyball and football and all of our winter activities, we have set target dates for those. And our goal with those is to get those out to you a minimum of three weeks before those begin. Some of them will be more as we're trying to group into um, more groups with some of the winter activities. But as you look at these dates, these target dates are three weeks before that event would begin. All right, uh, Laura, thank you for that. And you're noticing dates on those guidelines. And I think we were making pretty good progress on those already. And today has thrown a wrench for us as well. But our, our goal is to get to them, them to you as soon as possible. Um, next week, we have, uh, it's hard to believe, but we actually have an MEA week. Liaisons, we are planning to meet with you uh, next Tuesday again. Um, and then we're going to do a alternative delivery, I believe, for you uh, as of Thursday morning, a recorded version of, of what you're here uh, seeing here today. So we'll continue to collect those, uh, those items and those topics to assist you. And uh, we will have had plenty of games to learn from uh, where there are, um, where there's information that you continue to, uh, to need. So um, as we run over time here today, if we could uh, wrap up, Laura, and just a reminder that we have great opportunities taking place here uh, tonight, tomorrow, and Saturday, and with that comes the responsibility. We continue to say that we are the best uh, opportunities that our student athletes have uh, to serve them, to serve our coaches in the safest environments uh, that are possible with the best protocols that are in play. Uh, even today on short notice, we're gonna continue to get you the best information that we can but let's make sure we're continuing to allow our, our student athletes the opportunity to play and we're following those safe protocols. And um, Laura, I don't know if you wanna comment on any of the, the graphics that are there and if people have those or if they're available where they can find those. Just a few notes and reminders. 
Number one, these slides are always post, posted to the lead network microsite. So again, I see many of you trying to quickly write down dates. They get posted pretty quickly after this. Secondly, um, we had a planned update to come out to you today with some of those pieces about bylaw 208 with some clarifications about volleyball. We will still be getting that out to you um, along with additional things about the spectator piece. Bob addressed next week's lead meeting. That will be a recorded meeting that will be sent out to you as a link. So our goal will be to get that out to you earlier on Thursday morning, but knowing that your schedules may be different and you may actually be getting away from school for a bit, you'll be able to watch that video whenever it works for you. And then finally, just to note, um, these graphics on here, we sent out a link um, earlier this week that had some MSHSL branded signage for you to use in facilities if you wish. Um, the link for that is also on your AD dashboard. And there are about 20 or so signs in there that you're more than welcome to take and add your own school's branding onto those also. Again, just trying to save you and your staff some time and promote a common message across all of our schools. So with that, I think Eric, I'll turn it back to you for a quick wrap up. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Bob, Jody, and everybody else who's contributed here today. Um, as, as ADs and leaders within your school, um, you have every right to be frustrated with the, with the changes that happen on a regular basis. Um, you're tired. Uh, you're doing the very best that you can to try to lead uh, in a difficult situation. I would tell you specifically that if, if I were able to shut off social media to be able to provide communication directly to each of you and have you best prepared to do what you need to do within your schools, we would absolutely do that. Um, it's our goal to continue to be a liaison of information, provide the guidance and the governance that we need to as we go forward, um, and know that we continue to be here and we'll try to work with you in every way that we can to help you be more, uh, more effective and more successful with your schools. Please know that your administration, administrative team across the board needs to work together to create the best guidance that, that you can in your situation. There is no expectation from the high school league that you have uh, spectators tonight, tomorrow, or even next week, depending on your particular situation. Unfortunately, some of you are in schools that are required distance learning at this time. It would not be appropriate for you to have fans at your uh, contest. And obviously in, in required distance, you're not gonna have those. But if you're in distance because of other factors, it's very, very appropriate that those are restricted as well. So continue to do the good work that you're doing on a daily basis. Continue to uh, reach out to us. Um, we really appreciate all the work that you're doing. Uh, and a special shout out to those that have been a part of committees. Um, our lead liaisons are really, really helpful to us in terms of what are the things that are uh, hitting you. So that's another great resource for you to go to, uh, to share concerns or ideas that you have about how we can do things even better as we go forward. So again, thank you so much for your time. Apologize that we run, have run over. And by the end of the day, our hope is that the draft will come off of the uh, facility and event guidance and that it'll be ready for you. So I just ask that maybe we don't print that just yet and, uh, and use it online. And then maybe at the end of the day, if you're ready to do that, uh, might be more appropriate. Bob, any last words from you? No, great job. There's not a better group of individuals out there leading in our schools than our, than our ADs. And, uh, Hang in there and we're in there with you, um, assisting to the best of our ability. Enjoy the day and good luck with your contest here in the next, uh, next couple of days. Thank you.